Hi guys, it's Kim. I'm back again with another weekly stitching update. This is floss tube number 46. It is the 9th of December and it is cold outside. Um, it is snowing again. We got about three inches of snow yesterday and this morning the wind chill was negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So I hope it's not as cold where you guys are. Um, and I know like Australia, it's going to be hot. So let's talking about stitching this week. Um, for the homework in the School of Magical Stitches and Literature, I worked on Beauty and the Beast 2017 for three of the tasks because I'm also using it in Full Coverage Fanatics for By the Numbers and the Winter Wonderland Sal. And I wanted to get it done and uh, so I decided this is perfect motivation. And why did I get it done? Um, I did just shy of 3,000 stitches in just a few days, I just got really into it because once you're getting close on a page finish, um, it's really good motivation to keep going. So I did the three homework tasks. I did two extra credit tasks. And then I kept going even a little bit farther to hit the next mark for out the outrageous uh, challenge. So there she is. This is the full width of the piece. On 11 by 17 Q snap, 25 count, easy count. Um, and so I got my page finish here. And then because now I'm in Pattern Keeper and I can go by color, I pulled out the darkest blues. And this was a little extra bit I did for the outrageous uh, challenge. So the, my needle minder in case her neck looks, neck looks weird. Um, so that is nine pages out of... 25 and that bottom row pages is is partial so i am what is it like 41 percent, 42 percent done on this so really happy with that let me show you closer up you can see the fabric through my stitches but look how cool his face is starting to look so I don't anticipate working on this anymore this month um, unless it becomes useful for homework. So that might be where she ends the year on that one. And then to continue working on extra credit tasks, I pulled out the Modern Folk Embroidery 2018 Mystery Sal, which was Four Seasons, a Quaker design. And... Um, the extra credit task was final design in a series. And for sales, you can just do whatever the December uh, release was, which is actually down here with the word winter and then this part right here. I started this piece with the January part and this um, it works around clockwise pretty nicely. So it was really easy for me to actually just skip down to the December part because I had already brought this border down all the way. So I did 500 for that extra credit task, and then I also worked on it today already for this week's homework, one of the tasks. So there we go. Down right here, everything below that motif is the 500 stitches for the extra credit task. And then I already had the top part of this one started up until about here. And this morning I brought the top one over and I did all of the lower or the inside border of that <coughs> because one of the tasks this week is when they go into Gringotts into Bellatrix's vault um, they run across the two curses for Gemino and Flagrante Flag Flagrante I think is how you say it for the doubling curse and the, the fire curse so to work on a whip that demonstrates either one of those and um, there's lots of repetition going on in this piece so I used it for the Gemino curse 200 stitches now I hadn't worked on this piece since June of this year when I went uh, to the beach and so it's been you know sitting in my little project bag folded away with the needle minder on it that entire time I was disappointed to find out that when I pulled this back out the needle minder had left a mark this fabric is 28 count Monaco that I um, died writ died myself so you're not gonna be able, it's not easy to see but look above my finger 
And as I turn it in the light, do you see that circle? It's not really changed color. It's a shine or a sheen in this spot of the fabric, right? Right there. So it's never happened to me before. I know I have heard of it happening to other people. I think it's usually on, on hand dyed uh, fabrics. So I will no longer be keeping a needle minder on this piece. Uh, when I was working on it, I just put the minder on my grime guard instead, or I just stuck my needle in the, in the grime guard instead of using a minder. So I'm, I'm just hoping that most of that will be stitched over so it won't be as, as obvious once I get to that section. So that's four seasons. And then uh, for the visiting the love goods and all the unusual items they had at their at their house, I worked on a museum shelf, super sized color expansion museum shelf because uh, the Triceratops skull is similar to a crumple horned snorkak. And uh, something that I got this week to, to help, not only for me to enjoy the artwork, but to also uh, be able to show you guys where I'm at on the design. I bought an 8x10 of the artwork from uh, Amy Stewart's Society 6 store. So let's focus. I'm down here in this corner and there's your crumple horned snorkak. And so I just had to add 200 uh, 10 stitches. Not enough to really make a difference, but I will point out where I worked. So I was using DMC 3371 and my 200 stitches is right in here. So not much to really add to the picture, but it's still 200 more stitches. Um, something else I got in the mail this week that you might see if my phone will focus is this grind guard. Um, I went on Etsy and I contacted a seller that, uh, made grime guards for different size Q-snaps and hoops. And I asked her if she would be willing to make me a custom, custom grime guard for my uh, PVC frame that I um, made for my super size. She said, of course. She asked, she told me that the price would depend on what fabric and uh, if I needed additional width, like if it was gonna hold a big bulk uh, part of fabric. And I said, no, it's, it's rolled up like a scroll. so." The regular size, uh, the regular width of this would work. And I gave her the outside dimensions of my PVC frame. Uh, she was very nice to work with. It's, I mean, I was talking with her over the Thanksgiving holiday and she got, she mailed it out within a couple of days after the Thanksgiving holiday. However, I'm not going to promote her shop because there's one thing that uh, is one of my pet peeves that uh, upset me. Nothing in her listing nor anything on the packing sheet said that the fabric was not washed. The grime, the grime guard fabric was not washed. Um, but I did happen to spot on the email notification that it, it had shipped where she said she does not wash her fabrics. And to keep that in mind, depending on uh, what fabric it is and what I'm going to put it on. Now, my grandma was a quilter and both my grandma and my mom also made their own clothes. Like they, they, um, you know, buy the, buy their patterns, cut them out and buy their own and sew together their own clothes. The first thing they do when they buy a new piece of fabric is to wash it before you cut it apart, before you sew it together, because A, it can shrink and B, it can bleed. And so washing just kind of takes care of everything and makes it so that your clothes are actually gonna fit the way that you want. I don't know how many Etsy shops, cause I know there's a lot of people that make grime guards and project bags. I don't know how many of those of these women are actually washing their fabric before they start sewing things together. Um, so I caution everyone that they should either be asking about it or be washing their items before they start using them. Because we're, we're so careful when we frame our pieces and fully finish our pieces that things are acid free and, you know, taking care of them that way. Well, we also have to take care of them when we're still stitching them. 
Um, I did put that grime guard on before I washed it. And then, it, you know, of course I washed it. I washed all my grime guards together because it's just a good time to, to get it all done. So I know all my grime guards are clean. And it shrunk. It was harder to put on after I washed it. Um, so, no, I'm not going to promote her shop, even though she was a nice to work with. Um, I just wish people would, would wash their fabric beforehand. <sighs> Off my, uh, what we call it, soapbox. And then the last piece I worked on was uh, Trick or Treat for the quarter four 90 day challenge in Full Coverage Fanatics. Uh, last week when you saw this, I was almost done with the never-ending tree on this page. And it's going to look like I got a ton done, but the only difference is, um, you'll see the, excuse me, a concentrated amount of stitches versus spread out stitches that, that make a whole lot of shapes. So, I have to hold this the right way. So far in quarter four, I think we're about 10 weeks in. Uh, I have done 21,300 sti tent stitches, so that averages out to just over 2,000 stitches a week. Here's where I am. Oh, that row page is going quick, huh? It's just those darn trees take so long. Um, let me put some tension in this so it's not as wiggly. Okay. So, finish the tree. And I started making the, the columns from the, the porch railing and porch supports. And I have all this, um, we call it gingerbread, all the wood carvings. And I have the front door and the front archway I'm working on. So uh, I'm, I'm going ahead and I'm going to say it's not going to be a problem at all to finish this row of pages this month. And scroll up and start working on the next row of, row of pages. Let's see, I worked on it last week. Um, the bonus task was a um, whip that would make a good prison because of the uh, everybody being taken prisoner for Malfoy Manor. So it was 100 stitches per prisoner, 600 total, 1,210 stitches. And then I also used this um, today already for this week's homework. Uh, the first task is they learn about the twin cores for Harry's wand and Voldemort's wand. So you have to work on two pieces that are linked together somehow, whether it's designer, um, something in them, if they're both going to be gifts, something like that. Excuse me, floss tube itchy nose. I am going to work on it. Trick or Treat by Randall Spangler and also another Spangler, Sunday Delight. And they both have his little draglings in them, his little baby dragons. So those are the two I'm going to use for task one for this week. I already did uh, told you, talked about task two, which is the uh, the Gringotts Curses for Gemino, Four Seasons. The third task is <clears throat> because they were rushing to find that last Horcrux at Hogwarts to work on a piece that um, you have a deadline on or trying to get it done for a gift or, or something like that. And... I told you that if I get another finish this year, it's going to be on Pretty Little Paris. Um, so that's going to be my piece for that task. Uh, the bonus task, because they escape Gringotts on a dragon, is to work on a piece with a dragon in it. Or work on a piece that starts with a letter in the word dragon. Um, so again, I will count my <coughs> trick-or-treat stitches on that one for another 410 stitches. And then I'll look for an extreme task to keep counting those stitches towards other things as I work on it every day. What else am I going to work on? I have three extra credit tasks remaining. Uh, so a piece that's never been frogged for Neville because of his toad. Um, and for that, I'm going to use Pretty Little Paris. Uh, again, I, most of the other pieces are further along and you can bet they've had frogging, but Pretty Little Paris is pretty new. And then I have to watch the movies and stitch. So I'll either use Pretty Little Pears for that one or Trick or Treat. And we'll see what else I work on this week. Because right now I don't know. Um, I did some finishing yesterday. I got two teacher gifts done and a third piece that I can't really hold up because I need to find my hot glue gun. Um, 
you know, when you move every few years and you think, okay, I know where it was in the last house we lived in, but I don't remember seeing it since we moved here. <sighs> Which either means it got lost or it just, yeah, I don't know. But luckily hot glue guns aren't that expensive, so I might go out and buy myself another hot glue gun. Um, and that piece that I can't show you is a Christmas reindeer or reindeer with baubles by Doreen Jones. I did put a uh, pictures of it on my Instagram at Spartan Stitcher if you want to see. And the other two are teacher gifts. This one is a little Christmas cake freebie. Um, it was on the Cross Stitch Collection magazine uh, website many years ago. Uh, as a, down, a PDF download. I don't know if it's still there since the web, since the magazine is no longer publishing, but if I can find it, I'll link it below. Um, and then this little ornament I bought at Hobby Lobby. It's just a piece of metal with this uh, greenery that's got wire in it, uh, wound around it in a ribbon. All of this was already done. All I did was I um, ironed on some uh, fusible um, interfacing that's the word to the back of the fabric so that uh the fabric wouldn't wouldn't fray and i cut it and i tucked it under the greenery and i um used some aliens tacky glue to affix it to the metal back so one cute little ornament done in like 30 minutes it was easy and then the other one i made uh another piece that i've had uh, in my finish pile for a while. That's the third time the mail truck has driven by. <laughs> I really hope the package I'm waiting for is in the mailbox. Um, so another piece that I've had waiting to be fully finished for a while is uh, Snow White by Little House Needleworks. Stitched on navy blue fabric using DMC white, I believe. Um, this is in a frame that I got from Hobby Lobby, 6x6. Six Ended up being perfect size. Um, I don't remember what... I don't know if it's 28 or 32 count fabric that I stitched on. Um, and the fabric has a navy blue cotton uh, square underneath it so that you don't see the white sticky board behind the, the navy blue fabric. Um, thanks for the tip, Vana, the Twisted Stitcher. I had asked, to, asked her that when I uh, finished... So years ago when I finished stitching this because I knew I didn't want uh, interfacing to show through or white sticky board to show through. And she said in that case she always uses um, a cotton fabric of the same shade. So there is a square of, of navy cotton behind this. And then um, only the edges are stuck to the, to the uh, edges of the fabric are stuck to the sticky board. So the sticky is actually facing the back. And then it's just crammed in there. So it's not the prettiest job uh, because I crammed it in there and it was a tight fit because I didn't have the sticky board. It was just smeared a hair too big once I added uh, the fabric. Um, so the fabric is not tight. But my teacher friend or my, my youngest daughter's teacher is still going to like it. So and she's not a stitcher. So, cute little teacher gifts are done for Christmas. <coughs> Let's see, what else do I have to talk about? Um, I forgot to talk about it last week, and I had hoped that the mail would have gotten here earlier so I could show you my package from 123 Stitch for the Ingleside Imaginarium 2020 Mystery Sale, which is the Witch's Familiar Catalog. I will put a link below to the Etsy listing. Um, designed by Brittany and you know I stitched her Guardians of Notre Dame so I'm going to stitch this one. I bought two different fabrics in Lugana instead of linen um, so I can do a floss toss and see which one I like better. I was hoping to show you that but the package was supposed to be here Saturday. It wasn't. They said they'd deliver it on a Sunday. They didn't. And then today in my informed delivery it didn't even say it was going to be there but it's still out for delivery. So I'm hoping that it finds its way to my house. <clears throat> um, let's see. 
we are going to talk about giveaway winners. Thank you to everyone who entered um, for Camelot. I had nine people enter and random.org chose number two, which is Lady A in Stitches. You have won Camelot on for the Guardian Angel by Lavender and Lace. Seven people entered, or yes, yeah, seven people entered. Uh, random.org chose number six, so Jan R, you have won Guardian Angel. And then Chicks was the most popular. 14 people were interested in stitching it. Um, pattern by Lizzie Kate. Uh, number nine was chosen, which is Felice Amadio, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, so I will comment on your comment on that video and hopefully get in touch with you. You can either, uh, get me through YouTube commenting or, um, on Instagram, direct messages at Spartan Stitcher. So thank you to everybody for that. Now, before I run out of time, which I'm getting, I'm okay. Um, with the Society 6 sale, I also bought an 8x10 print of Once Upon a Fairy Tale. No current plans to stitch this one, but at least I can enjoy the artwork. And I also have a little, um, a zipper pouch with this design that I should be able to use as a project bag that is also on its way, but they ship separately. Okay, no Air Force story today because it was an eventful week in my household, so we have a hopper story instead. Uh, that is all the stitching if you're only interested in stitching. If you want to learn a bit more about birds, then stay tuned. Okay, um, Hopper is fully flighted. He flies a lot from his play stand or from his cage to his play stand for exercise because his uh, species of bird is prone to obesity. So I like to make him fly. However, springtime and fall time, birds molt their feathers. They usually molt their feathers in uh, symmetrical pairs so that, you know, it's easier to fly when you miss when you have the same amount of feathers on each wing or on um, in your tail, your, your tail's not off kilter. I knew Hopper was molting because I had seen feathers dropping off of him in the, and uh, a week ago when he flew, one of his primaries uh, fell out as he was flying, which isn't uncommon. <clears throat> but I felt bad that he hadn't flown recently, so I made him fly. It was about 8.45 on Friday morning, and he didn't make the landing. And he didn't make a, a good um, secondary landing either. He kind of crashed into the wall because he couldn't maintain his, his altitude or didn't have enough lift and uh, kind of crashed in the wall and then the floor. And so I got him back up on his play stand and he immediately noticed that he was bleeding. He had broken a blood feather. Now I'm going to show you on a fully developed feather what I mean first. Let me focus the camera. So this is a primary feather of his that he's lost. Again, I've had Hopper since 2004. Um, so I have a, I'll show you later. I have a big container of his molted feathers. But as you can see, um, the quill part, if you will, or, the, you know, is it's hollow. Now, when the birds are growing their feathers after, you know, molting them, uh, this hollow part is filled with blood to feed, you know, to, to provide blood, blood supply as they grow their feather. So if this part breaks, when this is filled with blood, it becomes a suction. It's like a, a straw that has suction. And so you have to pull this out of the bird to break the suction, to stop the bleeding. Now, as you can see, that's pretty big. Oh, let's focus on my hand. There you go. It's pretty big. Um, and so the problem is the follicle where it comes out of, out of his wingtip is huge. And just because you pull this doesn't mean it's going to stop bleeding. It's like, you know, cutting a major artery in a, in a person. Um, so... <clears throat> I knew it was just based on the immediate bleeding and how much it was coming out that it was a primary that had broken. 
Uh, so first thing I did is start gathered all my tools and called up my, my bird neighbor that lives just the next street over. Just said, I've got a broken blood feather. I need hands. And she called me back real quick. I'm like, I don't need anything. I just need hands. Get over here. So she was over here within minutes. Um, the problem being when Hopper's in a towel, he doesn't stop fighting. So I need someone to hold him while I pull the feather out. Um, I do have hemostats, which are like gigantic tweezers um, to help with that. And I have blood clotting agents, both powder and liquid. Um, but turns out the primary that broke was big enough. I didn't need the hemostats. Uh, let me focus this. So there's the actual blood feather that was broken. So this part down here is what was in his wing. So about a quarter of an inch was in his wing. And then um, there is... Now, the, the casing that you see here, it's keratin, just like your fingernails. And as the feather grows, the birds preen and, and chip it away. So it's this casing here is not the same as this because the feather grows from the wing tip down. So this part of the feather hasn't grown yet in this. So um, as the feather grows, once it, re like say the blood supply is to, is, let's say this was all in that sheath. Once the feather is this long, the blood would only go to about here so the bird can, can preen to a certain point to get that casing out. Um, so that's what that is. That's the feather that came out. I had to call my friend over three times um, because it is a wingtip and the follicle was so big uh, I couldn't get the blood to stop or rather Hopper wouldn't leave his wing alone and the bleeding would start again. Um, but finally after three times using a liquid blood blood stop agent, a powder blood stop agent, my friend drove into town to the vet and got some um, silver nitrate cauterization sticks to which is like a, it's a chemical um that you know they can use on on dogs and other animals um to stop blood we finally got it stopped but hopper is plucking some of his um body feathers under his wing because of course they were had some blood on them and some some of the um quick stop you know uh, bleeding agents so instead of waiting where I, waiting until a time when I could actually clean him and I tried spraying him a little bit um but the problem is I didn't want to get the wingtip wet but I wanted to get his body wet he's plucking his feathers he's a bird that plucks anyways and so any stress like this because it's incredibly stressful um it only adds to it and so he's he plucked those dirty feathers out and I'm hoping they'll regrow so he's not He's, he's almost naked under this wing right now because he, he plucked out those dirty feathers. But he is okay. Um, I weigh him every day as a good good practice. And so I know how much weight he lost, both in blood and due to stress. And so I'm getting his weight back up. Um, yeah, so he'll be okay. This is the second time he's, he's uh, broken a wingtip blood feather. I just feel really bad because... I knew he was molting and yeah, I knew he's not good at landing. So I feel like it's my fault. Like I should have, I, I could have walked him to the play stand instead of making him fly and still giving him out time without injuring him and risking his life and causing us all kinds of stress and anxiety. Um, but I want to sh show you real quick my... This is my container of hopper feathers. These are not all his feathers that he has molted in the, what was that, 14, 15 years that I've had them. So, I mean, this thing is jam-packed full of feathers. Uh, because he is a plucker and because he lived for three years in a um, pet store, they had his wings clipped. And so, um, due to the stress and stuff of being in a pet store, what he would do is he would... Uh, take his clipped primary so it'd be like this short and then he'd just start shredding the feather that it was still in his wing he just start it was not a blood feather so it wasn't hurting him 
but it's like a dog that licks or chews um, for allergies or something. It's, just, it's mental stress. They take it out on their feathers. Um, once we, once we <clears throat> brought him into the family and let him grow his wings out, uh, and so he was fully flighted, he doesn't damage his feathers until he molts them. And then he will tear them apart. So they'll be, you know, starting to come out, starting to come loose, and he'll, uh, he'll get a hold of it. And it's like, like this one, um, you can see it's kind of split. And that's just because of him chewing on it after it molted out. So I haven't kept all his feathers because if he, uh, if he gets a hold of them and damages them too much, I don't, I don't keep them. But to give you, you guys have seen pictures of him. He's mostly green, but he's got some really neat feathers. This is a tail feather. Um, this is like a, a secondary, so not a, not a primary wing feather, but like in the middle of his wings when he holds his wings out, um, he's got this really nice red and, and blue in there. So you can see a little bit of blue on that one. Um, there's another red one. Let me see if I can find another tail feather. There's another tail feather. So there's blues and greens and reds in there. Um, I'm not a I'm not into tattoos, but I have seen someone that has Amazons that they got a, a tail feather like this tattooed on their forearm. I'm wearing long sleeves now, but my arms are all tore up from uh, Friday with his blood feather, and I've got injuries on my fingers. He let his uh, displeasure known. So he does have some, some plain ones too, but I like those too. And um, some of his smaller like body feathers or, or smaller uh, wing contour feathers. Um, what I need to do is I have some empty ornaments. I can um, buy just the ornament shapes, the clear ornaments. And I need to put some of these in there. Um, so that I can have hopper ornaments on the tree. So, that's my box of, my box of feathers. Um, I have seen, uh, this was many years ago, like at the Renaissance, Renaissance Festival where, um, I thought about sending, sending some of these feathers away so that they could make a mask or, or a pretty fan. Uh, with the feathers but all right guys have a good stitching week bye